Christ our Lord, at your divine baptism in the Jordan River, you reveal that you are consubstantial with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Enlighten our minds and our hearts on this day of your great epiphany. Make us holy by the indwelling of your Spirit, and make us worthy to celebrate this festival of lights so that we may glorify and thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the Church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the one Father whose voice came from the heaven, testifying to his beloved Son, and to the only begotten Son, who is adored, whose light radiated upon the river, and who accepted baptism from John, his forerunner and to the Holy Spirit who descended and appeared above the head of the Son. To the good one me glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives now and forever. The earth rejoices in your epiphany, O Son of God, and the peoples and nations shout for joy on this day of your baptism. You have dawned from the Father and have sanctified baptism for us. O Church of the nations, proclaim the glory of the Son of God, who became man and was baptized for your sake in the Jordan River and cry out to him. Blessed are you, O Christ, O Word of God. You willingly emptied yourself and took the form of a man. You gave us a pledge of life in the waters of baptism, making us holy and heirs of your kingdom. Now, O Christ, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to sanctify us through this great epiphany. Create a new heart within us, make us newborn children of your Father, and pour out forgiveness upon your flock that we may worship you for glorify your Father and give thanks to your Holy Spirit now and forever.
Christ, Word of the Heavenly Father, you became man for our sake and were baptized in the Jordan River. You became the way and the door that leads us to the Father. Grant us your grace and mercy and accept the fragrance of our incense that we may raise glory and thanks to you to your Father and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Kaddishat, Kaddishat, have been truly blessed. All on earth be attentive, waters have been sanctified. Second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. Now I myself, Paul, urge you through the gentleness and clemency of Christ, I who am humble when face to face with you, but brave toward you when absent. I beg you that when present, I may not have to be brave with that confidence with which I intend to act boldly against some who consider us as acting according to the flesh. For although we are in the flesh, 
we do not battle according to the flesh. For the weapons of our battle are not of flesh, but are enormously powerful, capable of destroying fortresses. We destroy arguments and every pretension, raising itself against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive in obedience to Christ. And we are ready to punish every disobedience once your obedience is complete. Look at what confronts you. Whoever is confident of belonging to Christ should consider that as he belongs to Christ, so do we. And even if I should boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for tearing you down, I shall not be put to shame. May I not seem as one frightening you through letters, for someone will say, his letters are severe and forceful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Such a person must understand that what we are in word through letters when absent, that we also are in action when present. Praise be to God always. For the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John, who proclaimed life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Remain silent, O listeners, for the Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen and give glory and thanks to the Word of the Living God. The Apostle John writes, the next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one of whom I said, A man is coming after me, who ranks ahead of me, because he existed before me. I did not know him, but the reason why I came baptizing with water was that he might be made known to Israel. And John witnessed further, saying, I saw the Spirit come down like a dove from the sky and to remain upon him. I did not recognize him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water had told me, On whomever you see the Spirit come down and remain, he is the one who shall baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now I have seen and I have testified that he is the Son of God. This is the truth, peace be with you.
For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. If you look at many of the ancient icons that you'll see, and many of them will be in mosaics, these images, of the baptism of our Lord, for most modern people, they're struck by them because our Lord is often depicted as being completely naked. Oh, the waves are strategically in the right places, but it's clearly our Lord is unclothed. And of course, it's, it's surprising to a lot of people. And of course, what the icon is doing is not giving you a portrayal of a historical reality of whether our Lord was clothed or not or whatever was going on. The icon is actually teaching us something about baptism in itself for the viewer, not about our Lord, but about the viewer. And of course, in the Syriac tradition, the baptism is the moment that you are actually clothed with the garment of glory. You are reclothed with the reality that returns you on a path to paradise of the original state that mankind was first made. So the icon or the mosaics, these images, they are meant to portray that for baptism, we ourselves are stripped completely of this world. St. Paul in his epistle today talks about the flesh, the spirit of God, this power. But in baptism, we are completely stripped down. St. Paul will even call it the circumcision of our bodies. Not of the flesh, but he talks about with that Jewish push of the observance of the law of Moses, but that our entire physicality, in a sense, is stripped away from us so that the clothing which is Christ can be put on us. And so the icon is portraying the reality of the one who makes these things possible, of being stripped completely, of being plunged, which is the meaning of the word baptism, Baptizein in Greek, it means to plunge something. And therefore to bring about this renewal. But it is something for us also to understand that salvation is relational. It is not just about the individual. That when we are renewed and we are garmented in Christ, when we are reclothed in Christ, we are renewed relationally. So what do we mean by this? We live in a world that obviously has been given to us, culturally, philosophically, intellectually. It's normal. We are the children of our parents, and we are the children of the generations that have gone before us. And so it's an understanding for us to have that also that we live in revolutionary Times. And the notion of revolution just means not burn and break things. Revolution means to turn things, to revolve the thing essentially on its head. And in the 17th and the 18th century, the writers, Thomas Hobbes, Descartes, these other writers, what they began to do in the 1600s and the 1700s is they began to turn the thing on what is human life upon its head where the insistence was upon the actually the experiences within you and not what you are actually dealing with outside of you. Now we are so used to this subjectivity, we call it, my thoughts, my truths. We use these terminologies now of my truth, that's your truth, these are alternate facts. And having this way of talking has broken everyone intellectually into these isolated atoms which is why we scream and beat each other up, which was why there's constant anger and fight and strife socially. Well, this is something that is initiated well over 200 years ago. And so you take, for example, the term happy. Now, a lot of times you'll see in the modern translations for the Beatitudes, you know, happy is the one who's poor in spirit. And you're like, well, look, Beatitudo in Latin does have the meaning of happiness. But the question becomes, well, what is to be happy? 
Happy in its original meanings means to be lucky. You've been fortunate. And for the classical world, you could never say that someone was happy, fortunate, until after they were well buried and in the grave. You know, because you could spin out totally in the last decade of your life and lose everything, be stripped of all, and die miserably eaten up with tumor, ca cancerous tumors. So the notion in the classical world of fortune was something that could only be judged to say this is a good man. You can only judge that after the person has finished his or her life, which is one of the reasons why we never dedicated airports or statues or shopping malls in the honor of anybody until after they had well croaked, because you don't know how they're going to finish their life. That is the classical vision. But of course, what happens 200, well over 200 years ago, in the 1600s, 1700s, happiness becomes internalized, not of fortune, of the life of virtue, of goodness, success, but becomes the question of experience. My pleasures. Happiness now becomes something which is only judged from the inside of the question of how I experience, how I experience something. And so happiness now becomes something that I have to always be looking for to experience, to have. It's not the question of having a successful life. That's just simply living, being professional, working well in whatever career or trade that I'm in, to be happy, to be fortunate. Happiness in the 1600s starts becoming this individualized personal experience. It is the philosophical foundation coming out of Thomas Hobbes of why we have that funny phrase in the Constitution of this notion in our documents of we are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Actually, in the original philosophers, it was life, liberty, and the pursuit of property, the possession of things that are my own to give me stability, success, and fortune. To be happy is an external and objective thing. But it shifts with that. And they change in the documents in the 1700s. And that's why I refer you and make it clear that these are philosophers writing in the 1600s and in the 1700s. The American experiment is the first attempt to make an entire social order be based upon individual personal experiences that have been internalized by a new definition of happiness. And with that understanding that happiness is a question of a personal experience, it's why most people are mystified by this phrase, the pursuit of happiness. What does that mean? Does everyone have to be happy? Everyone has to have a three-car garage? Everyone has to have a pool in their yard? Well, how do we define happiness? Because it's no longer the objectivity of being fortunate. It now is an experiential thing that I have to have. And so it's by a result then that in throughout the 20th century, we become a people that have to be entertained all the time. Because if happiness is not about good fortune in objective order, then it is something that I have to keep feeding personally, interiorly. Otherwise, the downside of this idea becomes then I'm miserable. Why do you think that in America we have these how the huge proportion of the population that suffers from mental illnesses, depression, which itself is a pandemic, the opioid addictions, these are all, the opioid addictions are only an effect of things that are much more profoundly happening within us. And it all happens philosophically of a whole movement away from a classical vision of the world to a very isolated, atomistic individual that we translate into a public order in the revolutions of the late 18th century, both in France and in America. Why do you think the French are also always screaming in the streets? We are based on the same philosophical ideas as a social order, and we are children of those social orders. 
Now I'm bringing this up because, well, one, I think it's fascinating. But two, because it is completely contradictory to the Catholic Church. It is completely contradictory to the idea of what Christian life is. Because Christian life is to be stripped, to be plunged, and to be renewed relationally. And that relational aspect of relationships and obligations begins first and foremost, obviously, with the Holy Trinity. That when this individual is baptized, they are completely transformed metaphysically in their very being into a relationship with the hidden divinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. This is why in the baptism of our Lord, we have this Trinitarian manifestation, the voice, the Son, the Father, the Spirit, the Dove. This is to remind us that what's happening to us is to take and to make that beatitude that good fortune to turn us toward this relationship with the hidden divinity. It is completely contradictory to the notion of happiness being my internal experience. But of course, as you know, we live in a world in which revivalism, tent meetings, rolling on the ground, Pentecostalism, charismatism, whatever. It's all about the experience with Jesus. That has never been the vision of the church. For the simple reason is you cannot generate a feeling whenever you will. You cannot make yourself happy and feel up when you're not up. And that's not a sin. And you can't make yourself feel sorrowful just by willing it. So you certainly cannot experience the hidden divinity or grace or God or anything else you want to call it by just simply howling and waving your arms in the the air and shouting out in gibberish. You may have an experience of something, but it is certainly not grace. And it is certainly not God. You cannot experience God. That's why we talk about the beatific vision after death, to enter into the kingdom. So you can see in the modern world, it is completely in opposition to any proper understanding of Christianity. And the problem is, is it becomes frustrating and deeper and deeper and deeper into that depression and frustration for the simple reason that we're not always experientially happy. There are times when life just is really crummy And yet, of course, in that crumminess, you can be a profound saint and a profound mystic in that misery. He who wishes to be my disciple must take up his cross daily and follow me. There's nothing in our Lord's teaching about you always got to feel optimistic. You just got to go out and grab the world by the horns. This positive thinking of our American attitude. Now, I'm, not just, I'm not just talking about America. This is the modern world. Because of course, we make the movies, we sing the songs that go everywhere in the world. And we take this idea everywhere culturally. And I go back to the question of the principles and the fundamental ideas because as, as Catholics, if we do not understand what we actually are being submerged and bathed in, that we pick up by osmosis because it's in the air that we breathe, then we are doomed to be like everyone else. And so when we talk about the baptism, baptism is a Christian vocation It is something that transforms us and makes us relationally outward to God and to other members within the body of Christ. It is not something grasping. It's not something that belongs to me. It is something that is given to me to make me greater than what I could have been otherwise. So that it's not grasping. It's not a human possessiveness. Which, of course, again, in one of these American eruptions of religiosity, 
You know, Jesus is my Lord and my God and my Savior. Well, actually, he's everyone's God. And he's trying to save everyone. He doesn't belong to you. This kind of spiritual consumerism. We shop around for the church that fits my experience, things that I want. That's, again, never been the vision of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church divides up territory. This is where you live. This is your parish. You go here. That's it. It is just simply of an objective norm. But that whole grasping aspect we also refer to as being a spiritual infantilism. It's being the baby, grabbing the cookie, grabbing the toys. You've probably experienced this in the last few weeks just within your families of how Christmas is expressed by some of these little creatures of ah, mine, my box, my toy, my wrapping paper, mine, mine, mine. This is something that belongs to us by human nature. It's not evil in the children. It's evil if you're 27 and you act the same way. But when you're two, it's what just happens. But to translate that two-year-old aspect into spirituality, into religion, is as perverse as the 27-year-old who just lives as gimme, gimme, gimme. And yet they do this all the time in the spiritual order in the order of religion. And that's what we call it in a spiritual infantilism. Baptism is a communitarian thing. And this is also for us to have to consider in these weeks as we think of our Lord's baptism and the epiphany. Because as Americans, we want rugged individualism, me against the world. That is also another modern day myth. That is not the vision of the Catholic Church. The vision of the Catholic Church is by this relational transformation with the Trinity and with other members of the body of Christ. Baptism is by definition a communitarian thing. It makes us belong to a community which is the body of Christ. The Lord Jesus does not baptize us, have us brought into our faith, in order to be in opposition to everyone else as a rugged individualist. That is not the vision of the church. Baptism is where one is initiated, not even to an idea of a sacred club. You know, I'm at the local Methodist church, or I'm at the local Lutheran, or whatever. That doesn't really matter. There is only one church of Christ, period, anyways, in its fullness. And this notion that it is not some type of we lock ourselves away in this pious ghetto. That's the other aspect. Because in the world today, it's really hard to be a faithful Catholic. And again, on our psychological mentality, as we're just wall it off, say my rosary inside here, and then just look at all those nasty pagans outside, boo. But that's not a Catholic attitude either. Because baptism is not only a communitarian thing, that being stripped of everything, being plunged within these sacred waters, being garmented with the robe of glory, is not only that I am brought into a community, but I am transformed within that community, even as an individual, to be God's instrument for communicating that same salvation to others. So even the boo, hiss, pagans who are on the outside of that wall, I have been baptized to be able to be a lamp and a source of light to them. It may not work. They may refuse it. They may hate it. They may kill me. But that is what the baptism is meant to be when we say that it is relational. That we are meant to be consecrated within a community, within the church, in order to be God's instrument, both as a community, as a church, and as the individuals within that church for communicating salvation to others. When we understand what the full goal of why we are baptized, then it is very clear why the other things I've mentioned earlier in this sermon are so crippling. The notion of a possessiveness, it's my religion, it's my faith, it's mine. It cripples us because we don't understand that we have been baptized and transformed 
relationally to bring that same healing to others. The healing was not given to me just for me to be healed. It was for me to be healed and then to bring that healing to others. And when we have that kind of possessive internal aspect of happy and experience and all that, because you know these Catholics, why do they not go to Mass anymore? Well, not during the apocalypse, of course, but why, do they, why were they not going to Mass before the world ended last year? Well, I just don't get anything out of it. You know, it's just, oh, I don't know. It's just kind of boring. It's always the same thing. You've heard that. You've heard that echo from lots of people. You hear it all the time. Well, I went as a kid. You know, that was nice. Yeah. And so it was something I did as a kid. The notion of the transformation within the mysteries is totally absent. And so this idea of this transformation, that the thought that I want to leave you, you want to put it in one little kind of compartment, is that baptism is a rebirth. Our Lord, of course, is not reborn in his baptism. He transforms the waters. And those of you who were here for last week for the Epiphany on Wednesday, you watched the blessing of the waters. Because the waters themselves have been transformed. So that baptism is able to give a rebirth, but a rebirth into a network of obligations and relationships. It is all about the other, which is why our Lord says the two commandments are to love God, and the other is the same, to love your neighbor. So that baptism is, again, this is your little compartmentalized version of the end of this sermon. The baptism is a rebirth into a network of obligations and relationships, beginning with the hidden trinity, the three divine persons of the hidden one. When we understand that, not only is it beautiful, not only is it an antidote to the stupidity with which we are surrounded by in the modern world. And the modern world didn't just become stupid. It's just that it takes you six, five, six generations to work out the full stupidities in a, a public way. It's why Europe is living now the effects of the French Revolution. The French Revolution exploded 200 years ago, but it takes you five, six generations to come to the real conclusions of what those realities are. That's why I've told you before that for that same reason, the message of Fatima will only be fully appreciated in 2117. We are living through the development of what Fatima has really meant to be for the world, but we don't see the full meaning of it. We know the words that are said, but it's the same thing here. We now live. We are the children who have been born into a generation who are the heirs of explosions and revolutions through the 1600s, through the 1700s, and that were institutionalized in the late 1700s, and that in which we live. So as Catholics, we really have to be clear as to what it means to have received the grace of redemption and healing so that we can be transformed ourselves, bring an antidote to understanding correctly of the world that surrounds us, and in doing so, be able to bring that light and that healing to others. These are what St. Paul means when he talks about the weapons of war that tear down bastions of rebellion, that tear down arguments, that destroy arguments that raise themselves in arrogance against the knowledge of God. It's not fighting. It is the power of the spirit which is communitarian and which is transformational in its relationships, its obligations, and its networks into which we have been engrafted through those sacred waters. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God, the Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, the God of not to make, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate to the Virgin Mary, and became a man. For our sake he was crucified on the conscious cloud. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in the court of the churches. He ascended into heaven. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is the door of the Lord of God, who has spoken to the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Transfer him for the epiphany in your pews. Lord in God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you, out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom the sacrifice is offered, for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Amen.
Continue with the anaphora of the Twelve Apostles on page 754. 754. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Merciful and only Lord and Father, through your only begotten Son, you have prepared this spiritual banquet for us. Accept the offering of this bloodless sacrifice and grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with pure hearts and divine love, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to your holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith that are pleasing to God. and security and your true love and divine mercy be with us and among us all the days of our lives that we may raise glory and thanks to you now and forever O oh Lord we bow before you and ask you to look upon us with mercy make us worthy to approach your holy altar with pure hearts and holy souls and bodies that we may raise glory and thanks to you, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship Him with humility. It is right and just. Truly it is right and just to glorify and praise you, O God the Father, for your holy and the giver of life. You are blessed with your only begotten Son and your living Holy Spirit. You are surrounded by the cherubim and seraphim who sing with pure voices and heavenly melodies. They cry out, glorify and proclaim. Thank you. 
holy are you, God the Father, full of mercy. Holy is your only Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and holy is your life-giving Spirit. You are holy and the giver of all that is good. For our salvation, your only begotten Son, became flesh of the pure Virgin Mary, and by his divine plan he saved and redeemed us. Pretty Eleison. Wabiyamu khadakum khashro di layma bedhaye Ansaba lachma bida kodi shanto Ubarakhu qadash Waksu ya bertar mida karamara Sabakhu la mehne kulkhu Khunu denita fakhru diyala Dakhlo faikun wakhlo tsagiyem Metakseo metihem Khusuyon khawme wa khayin al alam alamin Kho qanna wa alko so damzik wa men khamro wa men mayo Barakh wa Qadash Wa ya bil talmita wa karamara Sahab ishta wa mehne kul khun Khunu danita Dumu dila diya tiki khadato Dakhlof haikun wa khlof saagiyem Ita shadu metihab Khusuyon Khawme wa khayyid al-alam al-ameen Amin Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup You do so in memory of me until I come again salvation, and we ask you to have mercy on your worshippers, and to save your inheritance when you appear at the end of time, to reward all people justly according to their deeds. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father. We, your sinful children, receive your graces. We thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we profess our faith in you, and we ask you, have compassion on us, O God, have mercy on us, and hear us. Anin Murio, Anin Murio, Manin. I can no damach no nute nabed lach mohono fagr adam shicho alo dilan. Amen. Ulam so kho dam kusono dimo dile dam shicho alo dilan. These holy mysteries be for the forgiveness of sins, the healing of souls and bodies, and the strengthening of consciences so that none of your faithful may perish. Rather, make us worthy to live by your Spirit and to lead a pure life. We raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. We 
offer you, O Lord, this divine sacrifice for your holy church, especially for our fathers and shepherds, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bashar Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops of the true faith, with blameless lives and with purity and holiness, may they guide your church and present to you a faithful people who honor your name. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, your people here before you, especially those who have presented these offerings, forgive them, so that they may always live blameless lives in your presence and recognize the blessings that you bestow upon them. For you are good and rich in graces. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, civil leaders throughout the world, that they may stand for justice and establish peace. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, all those who have pleased you from the beginning, especially Mary, the Holy Mother of God, and the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, John the Baptist, Stephen the Archdeacon, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Marin, St. Gregory, Bishop of Nyssa, assist us through their prayers and make us worthy to rejoice with them in your kingdom. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the fathers and teachers of the true faith, who have endured sufferings for the sake of your church and your people. May we truly and faithfully follow in their footsteps. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the faithful departed who have left us and have gone to their rest, hoping in you, awaiting that life-giving voice calling them to life. Accept the offerings we present to you on their behalf and have mercy on them in your kingdom. Through our Lord Jesus, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant us, O God, to the departed and forgive the sins we have committed. We will now Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, as it now shall be forever. Amen. pleasing oblation who offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice who offered yourself to your Father. You are the high priest who offered yourself as the king. Your mercy may our prayer rise like anything which we offer to your Father. Compassionate Lord, may we, your lowly servants, be made worthy to pray with purity and holiness and to call upon you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of your God. Yes, O Lord, lover of all people, deliver us from the evil one and from his deceitful ways. Do not forsake us, lest temptation overcome us, for yours is the kingdom, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And O Lord, bless your faithful people who bow before you. Deliver us from all harm and make us worthy to share in these divine mysteries with purity and holiness, that through them we may be forgiven and be made holy, and we raise glory to you now and forever. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for He is one in heaven and on earth. To Him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by the Lord and our souls purified by Your forgiving blood. May our communion be for forgiveness of our sins and for new life of the Lord our God, to you be glory.
Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us.
We thank you, Lord God and Father, and we ask that this divine communion be for the forgiveness of sins and for the glory of your holy name and that of your only Son and of your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, our God and Savior, you became flesh for our sake, and by sacrificing yourself, you saved us. Deliver us from damnation and make us temples of your holy name, for we are your people and your inheritance. We glorify and honor you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.